to talk a little bit about this exercise, which uh, I'm sure has had a um, frustrating side to it, but one that's that's actually a reflection of a lot of challenges in, in software, particularly when you're you're estimating um, for larger projects, uh, projects with larger uh, larger chunks of work. Okay, so um, the subject of today's lecture is estimation. Um, uh, it's uh, being able to give informed, uh, grounded estimates for how long certain work would take. Uh, and what I've asked you just to undertake here is an estimation exercise. Obviously, it's not in software construction. It's on very different topics. But it turns out it's dealing with some of the same challenges and some of the same psychological barriers and, and biases that end up playing a really big role in software estimation. And this quiz actually comes from a book on software estimation by Steve McConnell. Um, the attribution is given there from soft, the book is called Software Estimation. Okay. Um, and um, it turns out that um, this quiz has been delivered for years of 371 students, but also years of, of people from, from software background. And they have actually a fairly good um, sense of sort of what, how often people, um, uh, what fraction of the answers people actually get right. So I'm gonna go over some of the answers with you, and I'd like you to score your own quiz. Um, I, I want to I want to preface though again, Mike, or emphasize again. Sorry, I should have I shouldn't have said score your quiz. I'd like to get a sense of which ones, which answers did fall within the lower to upper bound range, and which did not. I'm not going to take off any marks for that as long as you give some answer. You you could be totally off base, and I'll still give you marks for having participated in that. Okay, so let's go through the answers. Okay. Um, each year, it's always a little bit fun. Okay, surface temperature of the sun. Okay, so I'm going to give for each of these an answer, scientifically grounded answer, and you're going to see if it falls within your range. And I want you to keep track how many of, of the total of 10 questions, the actual answer fell within the range, lower bound, upper bound. So here you go. Ready? Surface temperature of the sun. 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit or 6,000 degrees Celsius. Okay. Um, so, length, uh, longitude, or sorry, latitude of Shanghai. Latitude is north south sort of thing. And Shanghai's latitude is actually 31 degrees north. Okay. Um, Area of the Asian continent. Well, it's an area, so you know it's in square kilometers or square miles, some sort of dimension of area, um, some sort of unit that has dimension area. It's 44,390,000 square kilometers. So I'll say that again 44,390,000 square kilometers. Okay. And square miles, if anyone estimated in that, hopefully no one did square feet, but uh, square miles is 17,139,000 square miles. Okay, so 17 million or so square miles, 44 million square kilometers. Again, you're judging, did that fall within your range or not? Um, the year of Alexander the Great's birth, 356 BC. Okay. Um, total value of US currency in circulation in 2004. US currency in circulation. So that's dollars and quarters and pennies and dimes and, and so on. Um, 719.9 billion US dollars. So just over 700 billion US dollars, but less than a trillion. 
that were in circulation. So you know, sitting in cash registers, people's pockets and wallets, etc. Um, total volume of the Great Lakes. Okay, it can be given in in many different units. Um, cubic kilometers, twenty three thousand. Uh, cubic meters, six point eight times ten to the twentieth. Uh, liters, 6.8 times 10 to the 23rd liters. And if anyone did it in US gallons, just in case, 1.8 times 10 to the 23rd US gallons. So a lot of zeros, 10 to the 23rd. Um, but, uh, you know, they're, they're pretty big great lights. Okay, um, continuing on here. Uh, Worldwide box office receipts for the movie Titanic. 1.835 billion US dollars. Okay, so again, keep track of how many of these you, you fell within your range. Not gonna be reflected in, in the mark you actually get, but um, it's gonna be reflected in our discussion in just a moment. Total length of the coastline of the Pacific Ocean, 135,663 kilometers. That's 135,000.6 kilometers, or uh, 84,300 miles. And you know, you could ask questions, you know, how did they? come islands within it and so on. And, and those are all fair questions. And you know, I'd have to look up for this reference, but it was some principled uh, estimates. Number of book titles published in the US since 1776. And, and this was between that and 2006, um, 200, sorry, 22 million book titles published in the US since 1776 through 2006. Okay, the heaviest, the weight of the heaviest blue whale ever recorded. I should have said the weight of it. Um, 170,000 kilograms. Pretty big. Don't put that on your bathroom scale. Uh, 170, met that's 170 metric tons, because each metric ton is a thousand kilograms. Um, it's 380,000 pounds. If people prefer to use imperial systems, 380,000 pounds and 190 English tons, okay, which is 2,000 pounds. Okay, so these questions obviously have little direct bearing on your computer science career success. Um, but the exercise we just went through in another form will have very large bearing on the success of many of you in, in computer science. And I'd like to talk about the principle. So um, I'm going to ask for those in the class here, I'm going to uh, put up a table here. Uh, there were 10 questions on this, right? So we're going to put Okay, so uh, one, two, three, four, five. These are the the um, actually the number of these questions people got right. I don't want people to feel bashful. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask people here in the audience. Uh, including online, they can indicate in the chat how many people got that certain number of those questions correct. So I'm going to say like zero, and that will ask how many of you got zero? How many for how many of you each time I read the correct answer? Was it the case that it didn't ever fall within your range? There are no questions in which you it actually fell in your range. One would mean there was one of them where at least it fell in your range. Two would mean there were two questions where it fell in your range. 
Okay. Um, oh, zero. Yeah. Um, off by one. Uh, it wraps around. Okay. Um, uh, so, so this is a toroidal force. Wraps around. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I'm not going to look at you. I just want you to raise your hand. If someone, I'm going to point someone to tell me how many hands are up. Okay. Um, is anyone here online also? Is anyone... Oh, what's that? Cool. If you could, and just tell me in the chat how many people said that number. And then you tell me how many total hands are up. Okay. Okay. So, how many people here got zero of the answers correct? You don't have to worry. You don't have to peek at who it was. One. Okay, one. Okay, thanks. How many of the people here got one? How many of those listening got one answer correct at the time? Or in one case, it fell within your range. Only one case. Three. Three people. Okay. How many people had it fall within your ranges twice? Four. Four. Okay. How many people had it fall within your ranges three times? Five. Okay, four times? One. Okay, five times? One. Six times. Seven times. Two. Eight times. Zero. Nine times. Zero. Ten times. Zero. <laughs> okay. So there's a lesson to be learned here, although it may not seem obvious initially. Because the instructions, both written and verbally for me. To provide a lower bound and upper bound within which you're 95 per, or sorry 90 percent confident the actual answer will lie between them right and based on that you would have you're shooting for a situation where the most likely thing you'll end up here is is nine out of the ten times it'll fall you know that the correct answer will fall within the range no one no one quite got that. No one got eight. No one got ten. But there were two that got seven. I'm not going to ask who they were, but, but kudos to you. That's that's great. You were you were thinking about ranges that weren't absurdly narrow or problematic. But the truth is, the single most common count was what three, three. So. That is that close to nine, right? Um, but uh, does it count as a guess if you already know? Yeah, if you already know that the surface of the sun is about 10 K Celsius, I'll give you full credit for that. So that's awesome. Um, and I'm not quite sure myself where on the corona that's measured and, and, and so on, but uh, power to you. I, I really admire that. Uh, that's that's awesome if uh, if you know some of these factoids. Um, time to give you extra credit. That's awesome. Um, okay, so if you look at those in industry, and I'm going to switch back to screen sharing here, um, so those online can can see this. Okay, mumble. Uh, I've just got to prob this to to get it to share the screen again. Um, the the distribution for our class isn't that far off from the distribution for thousands of people who have taken this course. Um, the median uh, of this, uh, the value above which 50% falls and below which 50% falls is somewhere around three or so. The mode, the single most likely value is two. So, you know, this four here, you're, you're in good company of a huge number of software engineers. 
Um, and those have got seven. Well, you're you're way out here in this distribution. That's that's pretty impressive. You and that doesn't come up by accident. It comes from deliberately choosing broad ranges and putting aside a little bit of pride that oh come on you you know you know it better than that and and being willing to to push yourself to to um, you know test your sense of, of certainty. So there's a key, a couple of key take home messages I'd like to emphasize, you know, um, within this, uh, this lecture, which is going to be unfortunately a little bit shortened just because of the logistics there. And we may have to continue next time for some reason. There's a, there's this kind of um, phantom box here, and I'm not sure how to um, end it. Uh, let's see. Okay, chat there. Um, Okay, um, so uh, so a couple uh, key messages here. We're really dangerously poor at it. This quiz is an, is an illustration of that, but it's a fairly riskless illustration. And there's many cases where estimation actually literally is a matter of success or failure for project. If you look historically at the top 10 software risks as enumerated by Barry Bain in this uh, famous, uh, famous work, Theory W Software Project Management Principles and Examples, you know, he, he cites unrealistic schedules and budgets as the number two risk actually for software projects. And you'll notice the way that's phrased. It's not that the project failed because it it was late, which is often how it's phrased. You know, this project failed and it was canceled or viewed as a, as a grand fiasco because it was far too late. That's presupposing what late means. Late actually comes from somewhere, the, the, the criteria that you're late or you're early. It, it doesn't, come you know down from heaven given to you what the proper time is to judge a project it typically comes from an estimate someone gave early on an estimate how long will this project take to deliver and the fact that a project didn't wasn't delivered in that time isn't necessarily a bad reflection on the software engineers at all it may be a bad reflection on the estimate involved and a perfectly good project could be either a success or failure, judge either as a success or a failure, depending on whether what the expectations are of when that project will be finished. Same project deliverables, same stakeholders could be viewed as a grand success or a grand failure, depending on if the stakeholders have a realistic sense of what will be delivered. So estimates matter. And it turns out we're dangerously poor at it. We're systematically inaccurate. We're actually over optimistic. This exercise doesn't bear that out. But what this exercise does bear out is we're too confident about our answer. If we had, to some degree, a suitable level of humility, we'd be getting somewhere like eight, nine, ten of these right. Of, of, of these times, the true answer fell within there. We'd be choosing bounds that are reflective of uncertainty that's sufficiently broad. We have enough humility in our estimates that most of the time it falls within there. Instead, we tend to, to, to give narrow estimates that we, we, we think we're more capable of judging how long things will take than we actually are. And it tends to be inaccurate in a way that's systematically dangerous in the sense that it puts our project at risk of being judged as a failure. And um, at a deeper level, what, what I want to point to in this lecture, probably in Tuesdays as well, to finish up is there's a real distinction between giving an estimate, which is actually an informed understanding thoughtful understanding uh, based on thinking through how long things will take from a guess or a mere target, something we're shooting for, okay? Um, and estimates should be made by the technical folks involved, the team. They shouldn't be imposed by managers. 
saying, you know, you will finish this by Christmas season. Go do it. Um, it's, they should be made by the technical team based on an honest assessment, a clear eyed assessment of what has to be done. And you have to be very careful in this business to avoid placation and just saying, yes, we'll accept that deadline of doing this by Christmas um, to resist pressure and set est estimates realistically, not just optimistically. It's easy to give an estimate that's optimistic early on because it makes everyone happy and people say, yes, okay, great, we're going to have it. But then later, you have to pay the piper. I mean, it, 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 things, things may not be realistic to deliver on time. And that early promise comes up coming back and, and biting you. And one of the best ways you can deal with this is actually to do what, what you did for this exercise, which is to give range estimates. Not one answer, but a range. It turns out that's really useful for many reasons. One of them is it communicates uncertainty. It communicates, maybe I think this is how long it will take, but it, how wide that bound is between lower and upper bounds, that span is, will communicate how uncertain you are. And it gets a constructive dialogue going. You know, what would it take for you to be more sure? You know, um, how could you firm up your estimate here? Um, what would you need to do in terms of spike prototypes or in terms of further investigations or in terms of, uh, you know, trying out some solutions to make that a narrower estimate? Um, it also gives a sense of worst case and best case that can be really very helpful to inform a manager's sense of risk. Another principle which agile approaches really emphasize is it's much better if we emphasize the small pieces, a small sprint, maybe two weeks at a time, one week, three weeks, not three months at a time. Okay. Um, and finally, the big principle that we talked about quite a bit to estimate a task in an informed way, more scientific way, reason about its pieces, break it down in your head what's being asked for. Don't just give a lump sum answer for the whole thing. You break it down into its pieces and think how long each of them would take, what could go wrong, and you should be thinking about contingency issues with people on the team vacations that are needed, et cetera, and considering these other matters that might that might get in the way of delivering to give this low bound and upper bound. So these are some of the big principles that are going to come out of this in a single slide. And you'll do well if you internalize these principles. But let's 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 drill down a little bit. Estimate. Why is well it turns out we need to estimate at many phases of a project. Often one of the first things a client will ask is how long will it take till I can get my product? Maybe it's the minimal viable product, the initial try. Maybe it's you know a certain set of features. Uh, maybe it's a certain time till the uh, till the service is online. But we need often an early estimate to decide even if the project will be undertaken by the stakeholder. Before they give you money. They probably want to know something about when are you going to give me product, right? When will this be ready? When will the service be online? And that money may be left to it. Um, it's used for assessment level of risk there, and, and you know you need ongoing estimates of dollars and time to have stage deliverables to sort of successive stages. And I noted there's a big difference between an estimate on the one hand which is an honest, realistic assessment. It's a grounded assessment of how much time is the most common one that people have to do with dollars, human resources, et cetera, is needed to secure some objective. You know, realistically, how long is this going to take, for example, or how, much, how many people will it take? And again, we'll come back to the idea of giving that in bounds, not a single answer. This is distinct from a target. A target is something you're shooting for. Maybe an aspirational goal. We'll try for that. We'll try to pull this together by, you know, by um, the the Christmas season or something. 
it, it's a goal, it's a desirable goal for which you're shooting, but it's not an estimate. It's different from an estimate. It's something, you know, you'll try to pull together to deliver, but it's not that you think it's very likely necessarily you'll, you'll achieve. You're not saying it will definitely be done by that. And phrasing it as a target is important. Saying, not saying it's an estimate. And then finally, there's a distinction from a plan, which is, is a recipe for how to achieve the objective, how we're going to break down the work. Okay. Um, so it turns out we're forward estimation, and we're forward estimation in ways that are dangerous. Okay. Uh, we'll come to this a little bit more, more detail in just a moment. And one of the reasons it's dangerous is because we tend to ask, uh, we tend to estimate in ways that it's a strong optimistic bias. What do I mean by that? When I say they have an optimistic bias, anyone? What does that mean? What does it mean to say that you have an optimistic bias? Anyone? Yeah, you tend to underestimate how long it will take, right? You tend to think it will take less time than it actually does. And this is a marked phenomenon within uh, software. So I, here's a, a graph from, from an actual organization, it's a large software development organization, and they have data on a lot of projects. And what you see is two axes and what's called a scatter plot. So a given plus sign here, a given marker reflects a particular project that took and the, from the y axis, you can, or sorry, the x axis, the horizontal axis, you can read off its target completion date. And the y axis was its actual completion date. So, this one, for example, that I'm, I'm pointing to right here, you know, was its target was 80, and it actually took 150. Now, there's something that stands out about this diagram. If you look at it, anyone want to comment on it? Anything that stands out to you? It's actually a couple of things, but I'm looking for any any big patterns here you might see. Yes. Uh, the 45 degree line is because it's coming to the right side. Yeah. Okay, so what is that? So it's exact the right version. So what does that mean? Um, so the 45 degree line has a significance to it. What what's the case like for things that were on the 45 degree line? What would that be? Yeah, the actual equals the the target. What would it mean that there's nothing to the right of it, or right or below of it? What would that mean? Yeah, the actual is always over the target. There's actually not a single project here where the actual was less than the target. Are there any where the actual was more than the target? Can anyone give me an example of one that the actual is much more than the target? Where would that be? Yes, Larissa. The one where it's like less than one day. Okay. So you probably wouldn't want to be on the project. Yeah, boss, we'll get it done in five days and it takes like 260 to, yeah. Um, uh, and, or, you know, 20 days, 20 days for sure. You know, we'll, we'll get it to you. We'll shoot for 20 days. Sounds good. And it takes 230 most of a year. Um, yeah, kind of uncomfortable, isn't it? Um, I think we all can relate to this. <laughs> too many late nights, um, too many nighters called for projects to come together. But it's striking, you know, and, and the disparities here are, are striking. Not a single one where it came in sooner than Target, but tons where it came in later and even a lot later. Right? Those are the extreme outliers, but there's plenty where, you know, it took several times longer, twice as much, three times as much. Actual projects, a lot of smart people 
working long hours and in intelligent ways with with technologies, advanced technologies behind them. There's real human stories here, and they aren't all they aren't they ain't all pretty. Um, so estimates have a strong optimistic bias. Um, and the part of the problem here is, you know, optimism hurts us because these estimates are used to judge project success. And I really like the way that Emeka put it. You know, uh, we tend to underestimate. And one of the things that that means is that if, if we underestimate, our project may be judged unfavorably, right? If we overestimate how long something will take, can we deliver earlier? Typically, people won't be mad at us for that. They won't be deeply disappointed, right? They won't be really annoyed. They won't threaten us to take us to court or something or threaten to withhold money. They'll, they'll have to be pretty happy. But if we err on the side of, of being over optimistic, on the side of underestimating, people can be very unhappy. Same product we give them, they can be much less happy, right? Um, so, you know, a, a key issue here um, is that project success is judged by us. And if the estimates are not given by the team, they're given by managers, you're, you're, you're often getting in a problem. And, you know, sometimes what happens is they want targets, things you say, yeah, I'll, we'll try to get that out by Christmas. They turn that into an estimate. They say, you estimated you would get this done by Christmas. No, it's something we, we, we aspired to, but it wasn't something we, we said was our estimate of how long it would take, right? Um, uh, and, you know, the key part here, learning to, to say no um, and, and tell people, look, I wish it were the case, but it, it's just not going to be possible. So we have to avoid letting estimates be turned as well into commitments. Um, so Tom DeMarco, uh, who's uh, one of the more famous article, uh, authors on software project management, quipped once that, look, the most common definition of estimate in software is the most optimistic prediction that has a non-zero probability of coming true. People like to give an estimate as an estimate something that's optimistic, but at least it has some plausibility. And the problem is it's, it's very dangerous. And as he says, if you, if you take that up as your definition, it leaves irrevocable, inevitably, towards a method what's called, what's the earliest date <laughs> where you can't prove you won't be finished. And I'll, um, it leads to this systematic uh, underestimation. And um, it leads to projects that are actually successes at, at a technical level, successes and what they've amazingly achieved being judged failure prematurely, dead and buried, canceled sometimes, even though you're, you know, by all accounts, you're doing well, just because the dumb estimate was off, right? You're being judged against an unfair standard. So, uh, yes, Larissa. I'm just curious how, the, how you would handle um, the estimate that you have to be this is true. And this is a problem across industries. You see exactly the same complaint in construction, for example. Um, but, you know, to be sustainable as a company, um, there's, there's a need to ensure that what you're doing will actually um, give you a good reputation. It will give you uh, a reputation for successful delivery of client value. And I know it's, it's really tempting sometimes to seize that contract and say, well, we can, we can do it. But sometimes the cost, the benefits are obvious, right? It brings the money. The costs are not so obvious. Some of the costs are bad reputation. That's far away, right? It's down the road far away. And you don't see it initially. But another cost is you burn the team set and people leave and there's bad morale. And it ends up, it ends up undermining your organization. Um, you know, um, 
I think what you need to do is put a premium on a, a good, strong reputation and um, and communicate that. And companies which, you know, promise the world and can't deliver um, do, do get known, and particularly in a, in a smaller community like this. You get known for, for not following them. That's the best deal. Um, uh, it's, it's not an easy answer, but what it will guarantee you, again, it, part of the issue is what you see, what you don't see, what's, um, what's obvious and what's not so obvious. But another thing you can get at a company which has a, a reputation or a, a proven track record of delivery, what you can get is actually a lot of repeat customers. Whereas if you just want them, they may go elsewhere that time and you know they um, they don't stick. This is the problem. Um, but I think it's it, it's an it, there's a deeper side to that that I'm not fully really getting. To. Um, okay, so there's three natures of optimism that I would argue really apply here. One is there's asymmetry. Okay, so so look, um, we 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 tend to underestimate for a method. That's one problem. Second thing is there's this asymmetric risk. Like if you're off below the line, it doesn't hurt you that much. You say, oh, you got it down early. Awesome. It does hurt some because it may go to another customer, right? This is the stuff that Larissa is uh, referring to. Because if you give something that's too pessimistic, they may say, well, I can get it done quicker elsewhere and you don't put the contract. So that is one risk. But being off on the upper side has a lot of very big risks associated with customers who aren't satisfied and may seek legal recourse. Even sometimes. Um, and finally, there's this asymmetric psychological tendency that we tend to be too optimistic. Um, this first one is a little bit different. Look, even put aside psychology, it's a long tail on the upper side. Things, things are not going to finish before today. And things can take a lot longer to finish sometimes. Um, this is asymmetry in the actual distribution. Um, okay. Um, I think I'm... I, let's talk about this psychological tendency for, uh, for overall reasons. Um, one of the issues is competition. Where's the mention of this? Um, but there's also the fear at an individual level of being judged less capable. If you as an individual are asked, how long is it going to take you to deliver this? There's a sense, you know, many people have that, look, I, I don't want to be judged by my peers as being a really lousy developer and surely I can do this in three weeks. I mean, I've seen other people in our company produce apps in three weeks. Surely I can do it. And then and, and you end up talking yourself into giving a poor estimate. Um, you also sometimes want to have myself, you know, the people involved want to believe that they're really capable. So they give an estimate that's too that's too low, it's overly optimistic. Sometimes there's pressure on you, either from, from potential customers or from a boss. Um, and uh, you know, you don't you get the reward maybe for being given the job, but you don't see the cost immediately. Um, and it's very easy to give, a, frankly, a a, a wag, um, a wild arse guess um, for for many factors. Um, what what are often left out of estimates? Well, it turns out there's a lot of things that people don't think of when they give the estimate. They don't think about the people on the project and the fact that some of them may get sick or they think that some will be taking vacation or they think that some will be you know taking um taking time off for other reasons or holidays etc um studies have found that when you when you look at estimates they often omit you know a lot of common issues that come up the time to refactor, the time to correct defects, or performance tuning, issues idea of sort of um, getting the, the customization for different languages right or what have you. 
people have, have this kind of blinded sense for how long it will take. And part of it is also these issues, vacations, holidays, training, weekends. This is one of the dangers when you when you estimate a bigger chunk of work, a three month chunk of work, let's say. You're often not thinking about these issues. You're not, but if you're doing it for next week, for the next week or the next two weeks, then you're probably thinking, you know, Susie is out till next Wednesday. And if we're going to deliver this thing, um, we really need her input. Uh, so obviously that's going to slow us down. You start thinking in very concrete terms. You start thinking, well, next week, you know, is, is a long weekend. And most people will be taking surrounding days off. You start thinking about someone's away for training, et cetera. And you think very concretely over short periods of time, a week, two. If you're thinking months or year to put together a project, you're, you're a lot bigger in what these other bits of time will be. They're, they'll be there, but they won't be in your mind because they're too far out. So with agile approaches, we break things up into smaller chunks of work, and, and that forces us to think concretely. What can we do in three weeks? What can we do in one week You know, for this next deliverable? It forces you to think in very concrete terms. In your case, midterms, right? Someone's down sick, or this key tester, you know, it's just overwhelmed with work for 332 right now. Oh, is that, sorry, did I ring the bell? Um, <laughs> uh, uh, funny I mentioned that. Um, yeah, so, um, so, you know, breaking things up into short periods, uh, short time frames, like agile processes do, helps you in these regards compared to just giving a broad estimate for, for months and months at a time. Um, okay. Uh, right. Okay, so I want to talk though about some concrete techniques for estimation that have proven to be kind of state of the art. Okay, um, these are standard techniques, techniques used by firms here in town and all across the industry to give some better grounding to estimates of how long work will take. And they're best applied to smaller bits of work where possible. But they can be used for larger bits too, and or larger amounts. And what Larissa was talking about, like if you have a stakeholder coming to you and they say, you know, we really want this, this app with these features built, you can build it in these in these sprints. But at the end of the day, you're going to need to give them estimates for the whole thing. Um, for them to give the contract or not, to award it to you or not. And so even there, you're going to be tasked with, you know, really thinking through how long is this likely to take. Okay. And we'll talk about this technique called decomposition. Okay. And it's an odd term, but it's referring to the fact we break down the work in our head into pieces, concrete pieces that we think about. We enumerate out the various tasks, the various uh, steps that have to be undertaken. And for each of them, we give a range, not one estimate, but a range. Because the range communicates uncertainty. It communicates uh, that uncertainty to managers, and it helps communicate where that uncertainty lies in the project in ways that can lead to dialogue. Uh, and it can also help you deal with your tendency to overlook these sort of factors. Overlook these factors that are often ignored, you know, in, in building up a, re a real project. Okay. Um, so the idea here is well, you, you take a chunk of support and instead of estimating them as big chunks, how long each will take, you break them out into small pieces. Um, sounds really simple. And Yet it really improves our estimates because for each of those small pieces we think through, we tend to again think concretely. 
It's a different issue than only estimating like a week at a time. That, that forces us to think, you know, people's availability. But here you're thinking about, you know, the particular tasks needed to set up a backend server of this sort. How long will it take to configure, you know, Amazon Sync to support real time syncing between devices? Or how long will it take to, um, to you know, get, uh, get this side of the app created or what have you? To create these uh, these visuals for it. Okay, so um, here we're systematically identifying what needs to be done, and equipment or or uh, people involved, etc. Um, if there's specialized components, uh, hardware debuggers or something, and uh, and basically use it to to calculate uh, the resources required. Um, and a break it down into pieces allows for these better estimates. Um, you have clearer thinking, concrete thinking about these pieces. And basically, you break it up into somewhat independent components that will the errors may, may cancel. So you have a set of features, and you um, you can you, maybe you have some empirical data on this where you uh, have the actual effort, how long it took, and then the estimate. This is one of the reasons I'm having you do this for your project, right? You have estimated time and actual time. Sometimes I know some of those estimates even fall on the upper part of this curve sometimes. Um, uh, and that's that's good learning. And you know, you can you can learn from this. Now this says example results of estimation by decomposition. These are estimates for these pieces. But we're going to suggest doing this with ranges. And this, these are giving particular numbers here, but we'll do it by range. And there's a reason for this. Decomposition, taking things apart into pieces, um, is great in giving us somewhat more grounding of how long things will take. But the tendency here is for developers to give best case estimates. The problem is for each and every one of these, they will give a favorable estimate. And it'll tend to lead to the whole, to the total, to be off base in an optimistic direction, in a direction that underestimates how long things will take. Um, and one of the best ways to deal with this is to provide range estimates. Okay. So range estimates force you to think through your uncertainty and communicate that uncertainty to your managers or customers. And uh, per Larissa's point, um, when you're in competition for contracts, uh, I've been known done quite a lot of consulting over the years. Um, my own company doing it, and I've done this for 30 years now. And uh, when I do that, I like to give range up for how long things will take. And again, it gets that dialogue going in constructive ways. Um, so the idea here is to avoid point estimates, which hide uncertainty, and use instead range estimates that will that will show uncertainty, will reveal where the uncertainty lies. So with a range estimate, basically you're going to be making it optimistic. You're going to give some an optimistic one and a pessimistic one. Uh, a lower bound and an upper bound. A, a worst case or best case and a worst case. And often you give an expected case as well. Sort of, if you had to give a single number, of what, what might you think will be? But it's often best to just give optimistic and pessimistic. Okay. Um, so, doing this has a lot of advantages. The client or customer or manager has this understanding of where your uncertainty lies and how big that is. And if they're shocked by that uncertainty, that factor three. Then you start to say, well, yeah, so I'll tell you what I'm, I'm uncertain about. I'm uncertain about this. 
Um, and you know, if if you could pay me up front to do a spike prototype for a fraction of the money, then I could narrow down that range of uncertainty. I could make it a narrower range. I could give you a more precise answer. So a bit of investment up front, a bit of time, give me two developers and a tester, and within two weeks we could come up with a better estimate uh, by trying something out. Or if you cut out this feature, we'd be much more confident about when we can deliver the whole. It's this feature that's the one that's really uncertain. So that's one issue. It gives an understanding which can allow to negotiate. Can allow for a customer to say, oh, you mean that feature is causing you the uncertainty? That stinking feature? Well, cut it out. You know, let's leave that to phase two. Just do the first one without that feature. You say, great. Um, I'm much more confident I can deliver it by, you know, within a month's time. What's up, big one? Secondly, it makes the developers think through. When you're giving this estimate about these features, it makes you think through what could go wrong. And you're giving both the worst case and the best case. So you give that best case, but you, you give the worst case to a company where you're really thinking through, you know, what could be off, what could go wrong. Um, and it decreases the risk that an estimate will be taken for a commitment. This is important. Where you know the boss says you promised it in this time. Well, if you give a range, they're less likely to zero in on one number and say, you said it would be done by this amount of time. Uh it it communicates, look, it could fall anywhere in here. And often you choose those ranges. Think about this exercise. You choose them to be broad. To avoid, you know, you being held uh, to an unrealistic, uh, an unrealistic goal. Um, over time, often you get more and more certain about how long it's going to take. But sometimes that's typically that's matched with less and less ability to do anything about it because <laughs> you know it's already underway. The features are already set. Um, much of the work has already been done, but you get more and more clear on how long it's going to take and when you can push up. So range estimates. I'm going to give you an example of range estimates. We'll, we'll talk, talk about a major barrier here, which is exactly shown um, uh, in that table uh, uh, during our next class. So in a range estimate, you're going to give a best case and a worst case. Or you can think of this as the optimistic case and the pessimistic case. You think them through, you communicate that to stakeholders, and they're clear that you're not promising a particular value in here, and they see which is the one that's more certain and which is the one that's that's uh, really uncertain. Okay, and you might have a, a most likely case that uh, maybe you can have stuff. Right. Um, so this is a decomposition based technique. We're doing it for each feature, and then we're doing it in a range sort of way, communicating best of ones. Okay. This is, this is a safer method. Now, what we talk about next time is some subtleties. First of all, a key vulnerability here is these ranges tend to be too wide. Anyone? Too narrow or too wide? The actually tend to be too narrow, it turns out. Historically, people tend to be, they not only tend to be optimistic, the separate issue, they tend to be a more foundational, but they tend to be overly confident how well they know, how, how sure they are that it falls within that range. Have you heard about something similar? Like with this, right? Um, if, if you folks had given sufficiently wide ranges, you were given ranges that were too wide, where would you have ended up? Well, some of you might have ended up down nine and ten. Not nine and ten, not nine and ten right? Um, you would have ended up in this range. You were given deliberately 
like if people had said, I don't know how much a blue whale weighs, but it weighs more than a thousand pounds for sure. And it, you know, it weighs less than you know a million tons or something like that, right? Or you said Alexander the Great, I don't know when he was born, but he was born after 10,000 BC and before 2000. <laughs> you know, I mean, if you had said like outlandishly wide estimates, you would have ended up with like nine or 10 of the times it would have fallen within there. But instead, and again, I don't want to make that sound accusatory, but instead, if you have really narrow estimates, you get like two or um, three or, or maybe one. Um, so that, that would suggest estimates that are too narrow. And that too is a psychological tendency. You'd like to think, oh, come on, I may be uncertain, but I know I'm better than that. Surely Alexander the first, Alexander the great, I mean, he was born in the East, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, um, so once you're my age, I was born in the 80s. Man, that's a young person. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, no, I, I never saw, saw Alexander. Um, because yeah. I was I was born in Stone. Um, <laughs> um, so so here, ladies and gentlemen, uh, the problem is often people are it's too narrow. It's the same darn problem as we had in that exercise. The same darn thing comes up again. The estimates are too narrow. You didn't have to worry about optimism there because I don't think you particularly cared when Alexander the Great was born or how much a blue whale was. Um, but what you did have to do with this issue of overly narrow estimates, and that's what that was really focused on. Okay. So we're going to be talking about how to deal with that and then how to deal with this fact that the total here, like it's not quite legit to just total up the best cases to say i want to assume i get the best case on feature one and feature two and feature three feature four feature five because it's kind of unlikely to get best for each be like rolling dice you know and every time you get a six 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 um uh it's unlikely uh very extremely vanishingly unlikely but similarly, it's unlikely you get the worst case every time. So we have to deal with that. But that's for next time, okay? Now, for next time, I've also, and mark this online for the folks online, for next time, I've also posted another pop quiz. Oh, pop quiz four. It's actually a take home pop quiz. It's kind of weird concept, but uh, the take home pop quiz, and it's popping today, and you can turn on Tuesday at the beginning of class. It's online and it's a similar exercise. Be sure to devote at least half an hour to an hour to it. Okay. And basically, you're going to be trying to find defects. There's going to be two pictures, and you're going to try to spot where there's discrepancies between them. They look very similar pictures. It looks like the same picture initially. But if you look carefully, you'll spot differences. And, and I want you to record the timing. Of when you find those differences. And we'll discuss how that bears on the on defect discovery. And we'll look at some graphs from NASA about when they discovered different bugs within their software system. Okay. So that'll be Tuesday. We'll finish up estimation and we'll talk about defect discovery and the dynamics of defect discovery. Okay. Thank you for bearing with the situation here, especially those online. I'll look forward to going through the email and we'll make sure people get credit. Thank you. So, uh,
I'll check out the chat here in case anyone needed it. Okay, yeah, just the surface of the sun. Power to you. Take care there and uh, make sure you send those to me via email.